So in the four or so years that I've been using Python and been getting paid for it, I have seen a lot of beginners make fairly large number of mistakes while writing Python code. And I have made almost all of those mistakes myself as well as I, when I was starting out. So in this video, I wanna cover five of the mistakes that I see a fair amount and don't necessarily see talked about too much. Uh, so let's get started. The first mistake that I wanna go over is when people don't use the if name equals main construct in their scripts. Now, to demonstrate what this means, I have set up this very simple script that has this one function. It is an incredibly useful function, as you can tell by its name. And uh, what it does is, in a loop five times in a row, it swears to us that it is incredibly, incredibly useful. And then to take full advantage of this function, on the bottom here, we call this function, and then we can just run it as a Python script. And, you know, it swears repeatedly to us that it is very, very useful indeed. Now this is all great and whatnot, but since this function is so useful, we might wanna use it in a different script or in a library or something like that. If we want to do that, we would want to import this function somewhere. So let's go into an IPython session and try that. So from one main import useful function. And when we do that, the import actually causes this function to run before it returns. This of course is happening because when we do the import, Python executes the script to make sure that the function gets loaded and everything. And as it's doing that, it gets to line eight and the function gets called. There is a construct in Python to avoid doing this. We can just go ahead and comment this line out and uncomment these two lines below where I have if dunder name equals a string, which is just dunder main. This particular conditional is only ever going to be true if we are running one underscore main as a script. If we're doing an import, this is not going to be true. And that is something that we can demonstrate now by running the script first, just to make sure that it is actually doing what we want it to do. And then dropping into an IPython session and doing the import again. And now the import works as expected. And of course we can also call this function as well. Okay, let's move on to mistake number two. Mistake number two has to do with exceptions. I have set up another very simple script. So this script is also relatively straightforward. It is an infinite loop. And inside this infinite loop, we have a try and accept block like we often tend to do. We don't want this loop to ever really crash. We want it to continue doing what it's doing. So that's why in a try, we do some really useful things. And then we have an accept statement just in case somehow this print and time.sleep statements raise some sort of an exception. You never know. In this accept block, we print that something bad happened, but then continue going. Now this is great when you wanna just run the script and you want the script to continue running despite any internal exceptions coming up. But let's say you're running the script and things are going great and now you want control of your terminal back so you try to kill it with a control C. And you continue trying to kill it and nothing happens. So what's happening? Every time we hit control C, we get this message, ow you know, whatever, I'm gonna keep running. This is because the Python interpreter is catching the control C signal and raising that as an error. Now that's not a standard exception, but when you have a bare except like this, any errors that are raised are going to be caught in it and the keyboard interrupt error is also going to be caught. That's why now we can't really stop the script unless we do something like control backslash, which is not very clean. Now to fix this, as you may see the pattern in all of these examples, there's some commented code on the bottom that actually fixes this. Then the fix of this one is really, really straightforward. Instead of using a bare accept, we do the bare minimum in this case and make sure that we are accepting at least all the exceptions that subclass from exception and keyboard interrupt happens to not be one of them. Now, if we go ahead and run this script, it works just as expected. But if we do control C, you'll see over here, it's raising the keyboard interrupt error, which then does not get caught in this accept statement. We can also test that other exceptions will be caught by raising an exception here. And yeah, now we can see that the exception is being raised and it's being caught. Everything is as we expect it to be. And we can also control C out of the script. This particular mistake can become really, really annoying, really, really fast for beginners because they keep not being able to stop their scripts. And they're like, why is this happening? What is going wrong? And it's just almost always a bare accept. Keeping in line with theme of exceptions, let's talk about something that isn't quite an error, but can lead to some annoyance, especially when people are trying to debug an error that may have happened in a production system or an automated system somewhere. I don't exactly know how common this is, but when I started my first job, everybody would do this, where they would write 
try and accept blocks in this fashion, where in the try block, if an exception is raised, with an accept, they weren't using bare exceptions, but then they were binding the exception that was being raised to a variable e, and then inside it, printing that variable or sending it to some logging system. This is not very good, and I'll show you why. If we go to the terminal on the left and run this script, what you'll notice on the top here is that if we simply print e, we get whatever the message there was that was associated with the exception. Now, oftentimes things that are in the standard library are gonna raise a very useful error message, but things that may have been written by, let's say me, or a number of other library authors, the exceptions can sometimes have really, really terrible messages. So that doesn't really help you do a lot with it. On the other hand, if you look at all the stuff that got printed below here, that's the stuff that we want. Now, normally, if you run a script and it causes an exception and you're not catching that exception, the script is going to crash and it'll it's going to show you a traceback. In this case, we don't want the script to crash, but we also would want to see, I would want to see the traceback just so I can go back and figure out where exactly the error occurred and how to fix it. Now, there are two ways that you can get the traceback here, like I'm showing printed over here. Both of them come from the traceback module. One of these ways is to straight up print the traceback to standard out, and that you can do by calling the print exe function under the traceback module. The second one is using the format exe function, and that gives you a string representation off the traceback, which you can either print out or send to a logging system or save into a file or do whatever you want with it. It is worth noting that if you have logging set up correctly, or if you're using some external logging system like Sentry, they do these things automatically and save the traceback. But in cases where you have to be manual for whatever reason, or if you're just being lazy, at the very least, you should use the traceback module and get the full traceback. Okay, let's leave the land of exceptions and go to the land of lists. Now this one isn't quite a Python mistake per se. This can happen in any language, but I feel like the in construct in Python makes it easy for it to happen in Python. Basically, what this comes down to is that I've seen a lot of people check for membership of some number or string, usually it's a string because usually it's a path or something like that, in a very long list. Those of you that know your big O notation will know that that is an order n or linear time operation, and that is not very good when the list becomes really, really large and you're doing a lot of membership checks. So to simulate that, I've created this file that has lots of names, and then I'm reading them into an array, and it has one million members. And then I'm also creating a set for this because I want to show the better way of doing this. I've set up two functions. One is called in names, and the other one is called in names set. And both of these functions are running a loop a hundred times and then just doing something that checks to see if a string exists inside either names or names set. And then I'm timing them on the bottom. Now, if I go ahead and run this script, you'll see that the first function in names took a good 2.52 seconds. And the second function, which accomplished the exact same thing, took on the order of microseconds. And if we examine these functions, they look identical. We're just checking for the membership of some string in either the array or the set. But when you check this membership in a set, this can also be a hash table, by the way, that's an order one operation, whereas checking it against the list is at worst an order n operation. So yeah, if you have situations like this, where you're maybe checking to see if a file is something that you've already seen based on its name, and you have some sort of an aggregation data structure, don't let that data structure be a list. Make that into a set or a hash table so that you can do order one lookups. And if it's not already a set or a hash table, convert it into that because you can pay that cost the first time and then not pay it again repeatedly as you're doing this membership checks. And then continuing on with the theme of lists, let's talk about our last mistake for this video, which is when you create a default argument to a function that is a mutable type. So to demonstrate what I mean, I have set up a fairly straightforward function. I don't know if you would ever use a construct like this in practice, but this is good for a demonstration. The function just takes two arguments. One of them is a list of names, and the other one is some list where we're aggregating these names. The function does something very simple. It just goes over all the names. It takes in whatever the aggregate list was passed, appends the new names to it, and then returns that list. Now we want to make the API of this function friendly, so we give the aggregate list argument a default value. And that default value happens to be empty list. On the bottom here, I have put in a very simple test for this function where I'm calling it twice, I'm passing it the same array of names, and, and then I'm printing out the result. Now we would expect this to print out the same thing twice, right? 
okay, what's happening? This is really odd. Instead of printing the same thing twice, it's printing that list, and then it's printing that list kind of doubled up. So effectively, what's happening is that when you define this function and Python loads it into memory, it creates a new empty list, and then it assigns a pointer to that to this name aggregate list. This is where everything goes wrong, because when we try to use the default value for aggregate list, it is the exact same list. It is always pointing back to the same area in memory. So we just keep adding things to that list. This is gonna happen whenever you have a mutable type like this. It's only ever going to get initialized once when the function is first loaded into memory, and then it's never gonna get recreated when you call the function without that argument. This is not something that we normally experience when we have arguments that are floats or ints or bools, and that's because these arguments are not mutable but lists are, and your custom data types can also be. So this can very easily turn into a very, very subtle bug that becomes extremely difficult to diagnose. But given the theme of this video, we do have a solution. The solution looks a little bit ugly, but a little bit of ugly here will save you in the long run. The only change that we make is instead of setting this argument to an empty list, we set it to none and then check inside the function to see if a none was passed. And if it was, we initialize a new array. Now, if we go ahead and run this script, we get the output just as we expected. Now, of course, you might not want to do this aggregate list equals none thing, and that's perfectly fine. But in this case, maybe it's okay for you to have the user do a little bit more work and not create a, as I said, nice API. All right, and that'll do it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked it, please leave a like. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing and also hitting the bell icon so that you always know when I upload a new video. I have more content in the pipeline for Python, Space Max, and machine learning and reinforcement learning related stuff. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Bye.